let's uh, let's dig in. There's a couple of visuals here, and I'm going to move through them, and I'm going to answer everybody's questions. So, um, okay, so here are a few. This is you know to be able to tell if you have a problem, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I'm just going to move through. Um, oh, so. It, salience, tolerance, mood modification, conflict, and withdrawal. So first is figuring out if in fact you have a problem, which hopefully if you're here, you've already figured that out. But the point of this is that when you try to stop it, you it's created mood difficulties for you in the first place. And when you, you try to stop, you also have challenges. And what happens there is, and going back to um, questions that, that is here from, from me in the chat box is that, you know, feeling really tired, anxiety, sad, feeling really bad, um, always try to quit and fail, so they don't know what to do. Those are withdrawal symptoms. So that means that you are not doing the things that you need to do. And I'm gonna springboard into the unwire, rewire and hardwire because those are the things that in fact you need to do. And so, uh, yep. And fake thoughts. I love that. Intrusive thoughts, fake thoughts that tell you, you know, all the wrong stuff and OCD behaviors, depression. Yeah, exactly. So funny, right? Depression, all of those things are, are withdrawal symptoms. So what it means is that your brain has to unwire from the brain pattern that is driving you into the screen, which in fact is the one of anxiety and overwhelm, a brain that's running too slow and too fast. So when we talk about unwiring, and uh, I'm gonna move to the next um, sc screen that talks about the three by three approach that I built. And this is what I was starting to say before. This is called integration theory. So the way that I roll all the videos or most of the videos that I make on YouTube and every single thing in my program is built on something called integration theory, where I tell you the why and the how so the why is the neuroscience and how it shows up in your mind and your body, everything that's happening with you while you're stuck in a porn loop or a sexual acting out loop, while you're in the middle of your rewire process, and when you build the momentum and you get to the other side of it, the why and the how. So neurologically and what's happening as an experience for you, then there's the action step. So what I was beginning to say is that when you take the action steps, you're in fact changing your brain. And so by being able to do the action steps, you're changing the way that your brain is performing, which will make it easier for you to succeed. And the unwire piece is looking at your past programming, your past experiences, past traumas and dysfunction and past programming from your parents or from your culture. And, you know, of course that's broad. And so the takeaway for this part in terms of the unwire and the past if you get your journal out and you write these things down, one thing you can do is a historical dig. Look back at your life in five-year increments and think about some of the most instrumental things that have happened to you. Like some people have been bullied. Some people have had the death of a parent. Other people have been abused either sexually, physically, or verbally. There's neglect for some people. We all have family dysfunction, even those of us from the most bougie, as my son says it, the most bougie um, family lives, there's still family dysfunction, you know, show me a functional family. Exactly, Jaguar, we are all going to make it. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the, the reality is, if you can look at that dysfunction and see it for what it is, it can be really magical, because what it does is it increases your self awareness and self awareness is pillar number one in emotional intelligence. And this journey of transformation is one of increasing your emotional maturity. So when you become more self-aware of all the things from your past, your present and into your future, it grows up your emotional maturity. And when you grow that up, you're also repairing your frontal lobe and the reward center in your brain. So the takeaway for the unwire in one button, and there's two main pieces in the unwire. The first piece is figuring out some of the driving forces from your past. And you might not even be able to see them or know them, but being able to look at what your experiences were, break them down and how they impacted you and how they're impacting your behavior. And there's so much to be seen there, but again, you might not even be able to see it until you 
tool. You know what to look for. I'll give you two examples that I've talked about before of my past versus my husband's past. In my husband's family, they would get angry and get loud and would fight. And then he'd come back and apologize and it would be over. So he learned the way to deal with life is to suck up anger, apologize and move on. My family, there was never any conflict, even though it existed and there was things that needed to be talked about and conflict should have been raised at things. Nobody knew how to do conflict. So everything real was ignored. So I have to move towards conflict and not ignore it. And he has to be able to move towards conflict and not get mad about it. And so those are the things that we've learned to become better communicators and then be able to figure out, you know, that's our programming from the past built on our family dysfunction and our experiences. But when we change, when we become aware of that, now what happens is when I get a twinge of something's happening with my kids and I don't want to talk to them about it because I don't think I know how to do it. I move toward it instead of away from it because my spider senses tell me move towards conflict in a healthy way. And if I get overwhelmed by it, then take myself out of the situation. That's how you can use your past programming. And the goal of digging into the past is it literally creates neuro rigidity. It locks your brain in a mode that you need to be able to then go into the screen. So when you unlock your brain, it becomes more neuroplastic. That's why we do this stuff first. We unlock your brain, it becomes more neuroplastic and you can change it. The other the other piece, which goes back to Kush's question is, how do you overcome sudden triggers or sudden urges or cravings that reset the streak? You have to create a pivot plan. And this is a major section in the 90 day program, creating a pivot plan toolkit, a physical toolkit and all the right pieces in it. So in those moments, you don't have to make one decision for yourself because the hijacker's in control and he's telling you all the things that you should be doing. And the way you gain control is by following your plan. And you create this plan, your pivot plan, and then you run, don't walk to do it. You have three seconds to go implement this plan. And if you don't, what happens is your brain gets a dopamine drip and it takes you down the slippery slope towards the dopamine deluge. So you have to implement this plan. And when you succeed, then you can high five yourself and you debrief yourself and you look at all the things you did right So you can keep moving forward. If you didn't succeed, you know how I feel about this. It's win or learn. There is no lose, win or learn. So once the brain fox cleared from the relapse, you look at it and you go, what led me back? What pieces of this foundation that I'm building in the rewire did I let break down? I just talked to the 90 day group about this. And Jamie, you bounced off the meeting before um, someone shared that they nodded their head like, you know what? After you said that, you know what I let break down last week? Because they relapsed. They're like, I let this break down and that break down. They Mm -hmm. knew exactly what I was talking about when I said, you know, when you, because at the end of my program, what should happen is you become aware and you protect your new lifestyle, the foundation, because your life is so great. You protect that. You don't have to keep thinking about not watching porn. You just have to keep thinking about, you know, my, the, what you've set up, my wonderful life. How am I going to keep that going? So to be able to do that, you have to unwire first. And uh, that will that will pivot plan. You need to make a plan. Write it down in your journal and look at it. You can look at it daily so you remember what your plan is. Don't make any decisions in the moment. Do the thing you said you're going to do. And it should be dopamine producing, as highly dopamine producing as possible. Because remember, porn and masturbation and sexual acting out, they are super normal stimuli. They give your brain a ton of dopamine and a ton of stimulation, which actually can't be found in the real world, but you are going for close seconds and you're rewiring your brain to go, you know what? We don't go to that anymore to feel good. We go into the world to basketball or into the world to dance class or into the world to make music. That's where we get dopamine now. And those are the things that can really help you to do that. Okay. So uh, keep moving forward. Hassan, uh, I didn't, I don't know what happens if I, if you raise your hand and I answer it, I'm not sure how that helps us, but if you have a question, throw it into the chat box. I see you're going strong, super beautiful. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm glad that you're here. Just one relapse up till now. Make sure you learn from it. Win or learn, my friend, win or learn. 
Okay, so let's move on to the present and talk about the rewire. Now, this is the crux of the program. So if you remember nothing else about the rewire part, you have to change things. And I signed my son up for a coach because he's feeling stressed out. He's going to college, you know, and he's got some girlfriend stuff going on. You know how I believe in coaching. And so I got him a coach for teenagers. <laughs> he comes to me all distraught because it's not working. And I'm like, okay, tell me about this. I don't think I told you this. Tell me about it. What's going on? And he's like, well, you know, she gave me affirmations and I didn't do them because they felt cheesy. And I'm like, well, did you make them into your own kind of affirmations? Like, no, they were cheesy. And she told me to do this, but I didn't do that. I'm like, dude, you're, you haven't done one thing she's told you. So like transformational journeys require you to integrate, learn and do, right? The why and the how and the do. So, you know, when we talk about the rewire, I tell you the whys and the hows behind it. And I've already told some of those things on on YouTube, but in the program, it's all laid out. The gist of it is you might have to change your mental and physical environment. And, you know, some people I work with, they literally have to get new chairs. Some of them have to move because their physical environment is so triggering because of a 20 year daily porn habit that their bed is just triggering and they need a new bed, like for real. And so, you know, you might not be able to do that today, but you might be able to increase your self-awareness and go, oh, you know what, this computer setup, it's gotta be all changed around, change things. The more things you change, the more your life changes. You might have to change your physical environment, your mental environment, become aware of where your mind is at that's leading you there. And then if you can become aware early enough, you can put a change in place before there's a slip or a relapse. If not, then you can make it so that that you are able to, uh, you know, do it afterwards if you have to. Routines and habits. The number one thing you can do is what I am now affectionately or maybe not so affectionately calling the live program, the live plan in the middle of this rewire is you have to put a logical, sustainable plan that you can sustain in your life for a healthy lifestyle of brain boosting activities, those that give you dopamine in a healthy way, brain neutral activities that allow your brain to recover from stress and overwhelm. You have to make sure the brain boosting activities offset boredom. So you're not just laying around with ample time to do things that are unhealthy for mood regulation. And then lastly, figure out what all your brain draining activities are. And for sure, porn is one of them. And so recognizing how to build a lifestyle with this balance of brain boosting, brain neutral, and as little brain draining activities as possible. And you change all your routines and habits to reflect that. And you've probably heard me say before that we know that optimal productivity is one hour and 15 minutes on, 15 minute break. And like nobody does that. So if you want to be an optimal performer, do that and set that up in your routines and your habits, your thought processes. So the hijacker will talk first. When it's the beginning of this journey, when you have thoughts, think about them. Is that the hijacker talking to me or is that me? Because the hijacker will talk first and you'll have to learn how to talk back to the hijacker. That's reaction versus response. And learning to respond is the key out of this thing. Emotions and feelings, figuring out how you feel about things is really, really important. And there's strategies to be able to do that. But self-awareness and sp spending time thinking about your emotions um, is one of the most important things that you can do. So the live, the live plan is, it should be a logical plan that balances these things. It has to be intentional. It has to make sense for you. That's the second thing. The V in the live acronym is that it should create vitality in your life. So if you are feeling, you know, not good about your life and you're stressed out and you're feeling overwhelmed and you're, I'm gonna go back for a second. And you're feeling, I was trying to move the chat box and feeling, you know, not good, then when you get vitality back into your life by figuring out what are the things that you like to do. And if you can't think of what you like to do as current you, think about what you like to do as a kid. And that's called inner child work. And there's a ton of it in this program, but uh, then start doing those things. Figure it out, schedule it in logically and sustainably, and it will create vitality in your life. Now, if there's vitality in your life, you don't have to escape your life to try to find very unhealthy vitality in high levels of arousal in the screen. So that's why that's so important. And then the last, the E is experience. You have to 
create these experiences for yourself by actually scheduling them in. Which we're moving into summer again and I keep passing the lake by my house and I keep thinking to myself, I have to make the plan because I've scheduled myself up again, Jane, where I last summer I didn't have any appointments on Wednesdays, so I could go paddle boarding. Paddle boarding. <laughs> and and I love to do stand-up paddle boarding. And I would bring a different person with me, usually my daughter Sersha, because the teenagers never wanted to come. And Sersha and I would go out on the lake and Every week I would do paddle boarding literally for an hour. I mean, you'd think I was solving world peace the way I talk about this, but every week when I would go do it, I became the person that does the thing she says she's going to, to do healthy things for mood regulation. And so when I do that, it's literally, it shifts my entire week. Cause I'm like, look at me. I am fancy pants who went paddle boarding. Right. And <laughs> So it's really, really powerful. It stays with you for the whole week. And if you build it habitually, it's, you know that you're balancing your brain and it becomes an amazing thing. Uh, so that is the, you know, making sure you're experiencing it. And, you know, I brought my husband paddle boarding with me once. He doesn't, he golfs two times a week, all year long. He always golfs. And if he misses a week, he starts to get squirrely. Two times a week, he golfs with his friends. And you know, when we were younger, we had little kids too. I'd be like two times a week. But then as I learned about all of this, I'm like, that man totally needs it. We're parenting and yeah. running businesses and constantly like, you know, doing all those things. You need time to let your nervous system come down, just have some laughs with your friends. But the point is I brought him paddle boarding and he was like, he was like, uh, you know, like this is fun. He, he actually thought it was more fun than he expected it, but it's not his jam. He didn't want to come back with me the next week. <laughs> <laughs> but I can totally tell when you do go paddle boring, how the next day you are relaxed, you are calm, you're able to, you know, get your, you know, it's, it's really like a reset for you. And, you know, that's very important for, for everybody to be able to schedule that, you know, brain boosting activity in your life to give you that, that reset that you need, you know, it's, it's that taking care of, of yourself also, and it's really powerful. Absolutely. Um, and Absolutely. everything that Dr. Lee talks about in here, she does. So, you know, I can completely see the, you know, the, the difference that it does make. Yep. Uh, okay. Yeah. Mark, the L is make sure it's logical. And that means it's sustainable and you schedule it. If it's not scheduled, it's not real. You can't say to yourself, I'm going to play basketball once a week starting now and not put it into your schedule. And so put it in your actual planner. It's embarrassing how many planners I have, but this is one of my planners. Put it into your actual planner. And then I use my phone too. So I neuroscience shows if you think about things on paper that you will integrate and process them better. So I do planner. Yep, exactly. <laughs> See, we, we talk, the, we talk, we walk the talk, right? You put things in your paper planner, but then, you know, we always put it, we use a Google calendar and, and our alarms go off so that we show up in the places we're supposed to. But I'm telling you in the, in the summer, it's so easy to go. Uh, I'm too busy to go paddle boarding right now. I will ignore this alarm, but you can't ignore it. Um, you have to keep going. I will answer your questions. So keep them coming. Cause I'm going to transition out in just one second. I just wanted to talk about, um, the future real quickly, because in the future, what we talk about is hardwiring in these new routines and patterns. And I just talked to someone who's not in a great spot and I was talking to him saying like, okay, what new routines do you have going? Let's talk about that. And a lot of the routines he had going were ones that he could do in isolation, meditation, a good morning routine, a good evening routine, but he's looking for more connection. So he needs more good routines surrounding connection. Like so many people do so many people I work with that's like a second step or it's next level stuff to get connected with people with intimacy, building friendships, and then finding, trying to find, uh, you know, a, a person to connect with in an authentic way. But the point is there was some good routines, but some bad ones haven't fallen off and they all go back to feeling. So when you set goals for yourself, the goals have to give you the feeling that you're looking for. And loneliness was a feeling that he was feeling. So if you feel lonely, what you want to do is create of a way that you don't feel lonely anymore. And that doesn't have to be a partner right now. You can do that in other ways, but especially if you're taking steps towards potentially meeting a like-minded healthy partner, which no is not on a dating app and no is not escorts and no, it's not all the other, you know, acting out. If you're getting into a group that uh, you might potentially meet someone who's also interested in 
paddle boarding. And actually here on the lake, there is a group because I'm always looking for healthy, like-minded friends, which aren't that easy to find in this world either. On the lake, there is a stand-up uh, yoga class. So like I haven't done it, but those are people that, um, I, I'll answer that question in a second. But here's the point. Your future goals should create the feeling of calm, focused, peace, and joy, not just achievement. And what we're talking about here is coming out of hypersexuality, moving into healthy sexuality. So you need to learn how to regulate your mood. You need to learn how to come up with the goals that keep you in a place that you feel calm and focused while you are working and rocking out the lifestyle that you've created and coming out of hypersexuality and creating healthy sexuality with your partner. And I will talk about that. I see some of the questions that will jump into it. Goals should be surrounding your feelings. And the fault line plan that you do in the hardwire is to figure out which pieces of the foundation are breaking down and before they break down. And Jamie can attest to this because I'm a human being. Sometimes I have the fault line happen to me in my life. And for example, like I just said to Jamie, I now am scheduled every day of the week. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a lot of kids. So when we move into summer, I take a day off my schedule so that I have a day I can spend with my kids and I have a day I can do these things. And so if I don't change my schedule, moving into a season change, I end up in a fault line, which happened last fall <laughs> and yeah. I, things start to break down, but you know, I need to be able to do that ahead of time. All right, let's answer a couple of questions and then I can wrap that up. So the, the live acronym is L is for logical, make a logical, sustainable plan, schedule it in. I is intentional. And, you know, if, I think if you remember nothing from this entire webinar, remember to get intentional in your life. Think about the things you're doing and making sure they're on purpose. And when you are on purpose, you know, porn and sexual acting out doesn't fit into that formula. It just doesn't. So when you get on purpose, you don't need it anymore. V is vitality. Your life should make you feel great. And I know people think that's selfish or not sustainable in today's day and age. It's absolutely sustainable if you want it. It just depends what you want. And E is you make those things happen in your experiences. And I know for me too, is that I can get stuck in the learn more stuff, but not implement any of it. I love to learn and implementing is difficult. <laughs> so you have to create the experiences in your life. You know, if you want to lose weight, you have to exercise. You can't just read every lose weight book in the world. It requires you to change the way you eat and to move your body. It's just the way that it goes. It's the same thing for this program. It requires you to change your routines and your habits and your thought processes. It requires you to look into your past and it requires you to set some goals. And that's, that's the real deal. And you said something really powerful when you, you force yourself, you know, low, low key risk taking, you know, having that, um, adrenaline, you know, for, for different things that you do in, in those experiences, you know, make them what they are. And, um, when we talked about it in the, the small group, it really was yeah. a powerful statement when you said yeah, that. Yeah. And that's what vitality is and, and what, uh, let's see if I can, what happens if I, let me see. Oh, I can allow people to talk. Hassan, if I, if I hit, this, we can allow you to talk, which I will do in one minute. Um, what vitality is, is being able to exactly hit the friction point of having some, you know, anxiety, a little bit of anxiousness around it. So like when I took motorcycle lessons last summer, like I was totally nervous about going, but, you know, and I went out of town, I had to get a hotel. I stayed overnight. I had to get my motorcycle gear. Like, you know, it hit the sweet spot of, I'm going to learn a new thing. And at the same time, I'm excited about it, but I'm a little anxious about it. My daughter rides horses. She has a horse show this Saturday. She can't stop talking about how nervous sighted. But a cool thing she says is every time we pull into the barn, she goes two times a week to the barn to be around the horses. Every time she says how she has that feeling inside. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm going to well, let me answer a couple of these questions and then I can open up the lines here for a second. Are there differences between overcoming porn as a woman versus a man? Um, I can tell you that unfortunately women, when, and this is just, obviously this is a stereotypical statement is that it's the same. The processes are the same neurologically and the recovery is the exact same. And we have women in the 90 day program. We don't have a group for women because it's not a good idea to have cross-gender groups. 
but the 90 day program itself, we have women in who move through the digital program. The thing I was going to say is that what science shows is that when women get roped into an addiction, it can be more difficult for women. Their brains get hijacked stronger. So it can be a little bit more difficult to come out, but not impossible. We have women who are, are rocking it and coming out um, all the time. Let's see. Uh, I'm reading a question here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm reading a question. I made a couple of videos about, okay, how do you handle dating rejection? I just made a video. So if you haven't seen that video, this question is, um, you know, interestingly, these girls are my type who were really my type, the one also who was really interested in me, but when I'm dating, them, I relapsed in between the reactions and vibe and end up ghosting. Uh, so, you know, part of that is that if you still go into the screen or, set, or acting out behaviors, your brain is not in the healthiest place to attract a healthy partner. And that becomes challenging because it will put you in a spot where like, you know, it's hypersexuality. So if you're, you, a lot of people have told me this too in the program that long story short, you may need to not try to find a partner and let your brain have a washout of sexual behavior. Cause a lot of people can be really successful with that at the beginning, because if you're trying to look for sex in a healthy way, but your brain's used to getting in an unhealthy way, you're like crossing over those neural pathways where if you give yourself a washout period, you can let the old neural pathways die off while you're creating the new neural pathways. And when they are fired up, then you start taking them. And when you're trying to do both things for some people, because, you know, kind of, uh, there's a lot wrapped up in, in, in that. Um, but this is what I know is that if you want to attract a healthy partner to you and your brain's in a good spot and you've done these things, then you can attract someone to you who you connect with, spend time together, have a ton of fun and healthy sex, feel good when you're alone and don't feel like you're going to die until you get back to your girlfriend. You have an interdependent relationship and you're able to, you know, move towards that. Uh, okay. Tom's question, avoid porn for almost two months, but two slips for when I watch. Yep. Uh, so here is the thing too. And I know men who have videos with their partners, it is cheating your progress. And I will tell you why. And let me tell you, Tom, what uh, if you're open to a suggestion, because I know it might not feel good, is that if you can, if you watch a video of you having sex, even if it's with your partner, you are in fact like go undergoing the act of consuming sex on a video, even though it feels better because it's you and your partner, it's still like not an experience, it's consuming a performance. So it's still not healthy for you now, probably never. And the reason that you have it is because that is what your brain wanted back in the past when it needed to, to watch sex to get dopamine. So I would encourage you to burn the bridges on that stuff. And you know how, if you've seen the video that I made on burning the bridges is thinking about anything that puts you as the consumer of sex and getting rid of those because the hijacker in your brain will tell you it's fine, but really it's going to detract from your experience if you're watching it. So when I work with people, I tell them, adios, anything that makes you watch sex because you want your brain trained to experience it. They are two totally different things. Um, let's see, what else? Um, Muhammad, I'm going to talk real quick about fetishes. What do we got here on time? Um, talk about fetishes for Muhammad. And fetishes, you know, I think it's really just a jacked up word for um, what your arousal template has become. So fetishes or your arousal template, whatever we're going to call it. Uh, and actually, I, I'll, I'm going to switch the screen to, to the visual for a second as I answer this question. The arousal template is what your brain had been conditioned to consume. So it becomes part of your arousal template. So whatever acts or genres, and for many people, fetishes go back to some 
type of experience in their childhood, or it could be the first kind of porn that you found, or the thing that gave you the most arousal when you were young. It goes back to kind of that first dopamine deluge. And it's linked that way for many people. And that's how fetishes or arousal templates really kind of get seared in your brain early on. And then when you consume pornography and you're watching that thing over and over and over, you are deep grooving those neural pathways. So depending upon how deep those neural pathways are kind of embedded into your brain, I will encourage people if it's something that can be incorporated into a healthy sex life to find a way to do that. And of course you have to you know, have your partner be able to um, agree that that stays in the sexual arousal garden. My mentor, he would, I hate, I hate it. I don't like it at all, because, but I think it does the job, this uh, kind of, you know, analogy that you have to talk to your partner and agree what stays in the garden. If it's something your partner doesn't want to do, then it has to come out of the garden. You have to find ways to get over that. And if not, if it can stay in the garden, then you agree to it and how often and what type, then you can get those larger dopamine hits from that part of the arousal template. But if it's unhealthy for you, you have to not fire up those neural pathways and fire up the new neural pathways for healthy sexuality as you're developing it. Um, have you answered some the questions in Q&A? Because I told people to actually put them in Q&A and not chat because no, there's, no, there's so I'm many not. things. I didn't even know about this here Q&A. So let me jump in here. Uh, yeah, I can. Okay, so Daniel Campbell, let me answer that. I'll jump between the two of them. Uh, yeah, I can see I just got done looking through someone's uh, Muse. And yeah, Muse 1, I can see graphs from a person's Muse 1. If you have a Muse 1, you can totally use that. And I can see your brain graphs and I can see progress as it's, um, as it's being made over time. Let me see. Let's read it. I don't have a porn addiction per se from anonymous, but what I do have is a very high sexual urge all the time. That's hypersexuality. I tend to imagine about anyone I find attractive and then pleasuring myself. Hypersexuality in it, and your brain is using it for mood regulation. Very ashamed, built on a shame cycle. Um, women in your family. Yep. So this is something that happens to a lot of people that they can become attracted to people in their family. But this is what I want to encourage you so we can get rid of this shame cycle is that your brain is looking for dopamine. Those women's body parts are dopamine hits. Just think of it like a drug. So, you know, your brain isn't, doesn't know that it shouldn't look for the dopamine hit from your aunt instead of a random person. It just sees body parts as dopamine hits, but that's not enough to get over the shame. I, and I'm going to make a video to remind everybody of this. I was looking it up again this morning is that every cell in our body changes and is regenerated every seven years. So when you, and I tell people in my program, when you get on this program and you start working through it, you're becoming a new person cell by cell, like literally. And so seven years from now, you're going to be an absolutely different person. And, and so you can be a person, absolutely different cellular person who's doing the same stuff or worse, but you can take the opportunity to become a totally different person who's doing new things. And the more time and distance you get from the old version of yourself who needed the old dopamine hits from all the women that you saw, even family members, you get a little distance from it and you're able to have empathy for that old version of yourself. And when you can, and it's inner child work, when you can have empathy for that old version. And I wanted to make a comment actually about some of the comments in the chat box, because I don't want you to see this as a war and I don't want you to see this as a, as a fight. Because when you tell the hijacker, you're here for the war, you're here for the battle, you're here for the fight, what that does, it makes you push. And if you push, if you've ever gotten a fight before and you push someone, what do they do? They push you back twice as hard. And so they're attacking you back and you have to attack. That, that's not how this thing is won. This thing is won by building empathy and building love for yourself, first and foremost, for the rest of humanity where you don't wanna see them as body parts and you don't want to do anything that would damage your brain while you're using other people. So when you approach it like from, from love and like I said, the feeling of you wanna be calm and focused and at peace and have joy in your life, when you focus it on it like as a transformational journey, I know I, it's abusive how many times I call it an opportunity, but it's true, there's an opportunity to grow and to develop. 
And when you see that, you can take the hardest things in your life and go, I'm going to use this. I'm going to squeeze the lemonade out of this thing and make lemon. You know, I'm going to take these lemons. I'm going to make them into lemonade. So let's not think of it as a battle. And, and every day, don't battle the temptations. Learn from them. And when you get a plan, implement your plan. And if your plan doesn't succeed, you know, if it first it doesn't succeed, try, change, and try, try again. Don't just try it again. Change it and then try it again. Um, okay, let me move through. Hmm, Ryan has a, I've noticed lately my sexual thoughts have been about my past real life sexual encounters rather than porn scenes that I've watched. Would you consider that progress? It might be considered progress. A lot of people do this, but don't stop there because I work with a lot of people who really do get hung up on that for a long time. And that is not a place that I want you to have to stay in for any amount of time. So, you know, come out of fantasy and when it, here's my fast spiel on the past, present, and the future. When you go back to the past, use all your past experiences to inform your present behavior and kind of take the lessons out of it. Don't just go back there for dopamine hits. Take the lessons out of it. What's the lesson to be learned? And so like, if there's things that you liked in that sexual encounter that you want to get going in your you know, current or future one, that's the lesson, but do not allow your brain to just keep going back because then you'll be stuck in old neural pathways. Uh, oh, sure, uh, Princess, how the hijacker is stronger in women. So, and this will be um, pertinent for everybody, even men or women who are listening. So basically there's a cycle of porn addiction the way that porn becomes addictive in the first place and then develops over time. So the way that it becomes addictive is your brain gets this dopamine rush the first time that you watch it. The second time you consume it, you have to create, your brain creates this these new levels. So what happens in women is that those levels become even higher right away. And then as you keep going back, you're kind of grooving those pathways in faster and harder earlier. And so addiction happens to women a lot less, but when it does, it can be more difficult to unwire those neural pathways, but not impossible. So the takeaway is it's the same mechanisms for men as it is for women. You have to look into your past, resolve it, unlock the neuro rigidity, figure out what your patterns are, change them. Change what you're doing in the present first and foremost. Porn's a super normal stimulus for everybody. You gotta stay out of the screen and you have to Stop doing any sexual acting out behaviors that are unhealthy for you, hypersexuality, new routines and habits, new thought processes. It's the same process, princess. So, you know, it's, it, and for you, it might not even be more difficult. It's just difficult, more difficult for some women. Uh, S21 Ultra, I'm autistic, 33 year old man. And just so you know, I don't, I don't know if you've heard me say that I actually have a lot of expertise in uh, autistic spectrum disorder. So I know a lot about it. Um, so I'm single will probably, you will not be forever if you don't want to. And if you are discouraged about that, you can look up because I am um, an expert in autistic spectrum disorder. I get served things, you know how that goes? The things that I, I'm always getting served about people who are on the spectrum who found the perfect mate and have gotten married. Anybody out there can find the perfect mate if they want to. Yep. Um, but you're totally right that if your parents support you the whole time and they don't make a plan for you and you don't help them make a plan for you that you may end up living with them and not developing, you know, this life's tough. Skills. man. It's not, yeah. You got to develop the skills. And, yep. you know, even people who aren't autistic are stuck in this position. And what I say to them, like I'm one person I'm working, not one, a few people I'm working with right now. I'm like, you have to, you don't cut the cord from your parent. You, and, and, you know, especially if you're on the spectrum, you should be able to, your parents should be able to help you get support services that you'll qualify financially to get for free, uh, a job coach or a life coach that can help you make a transition plan. One of my best friends has two sons that are on the spectrum and she's been life planning her son's transition since he was like five. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, she had to get a wait list. She had to get on a wait list when he was five to get, you know, housing for him. And now he's 25 and she's working the plan she started making. Okay, but let me keep reading here. Edging, we'll talk about edging because edging to porn for over 20 years. So, you know, more of your problem might be edging to porn than autism, to be honest, because if you've been edging to porn, you are knocking out your frontal lobe and you are desensitizing the reward center in your brain. 
And if you're a person on the spectrum, your brain pattern is already in that direction, which means you're doubling a, a baseline that's different from a you know neurotypical brain. So edging's the bigger of the two things that you need to address there, which is exactly what we're doing here. Uh, yeah, and then binaural beats, what you're doing is you're, when binaural beats is a lower grade type of neurotherapy, and basically what it does is it puts a frequency of sound in one ear and a different frequency in the other ear, and they cancel each other out, but your brain is being attuned to that frequency. So for you, depending upon you know, what frequency you're using for binaural beats, you're probably slowing the brain's energy down so it feels more euphoric. So if that's what you're doing, if you're slowing it down, you're going triple on the slowing down of the brain, which is going to make it so that you can't use executive function. It's going to make it so that you have more of the issues that would that you might be thinking is because of autism. It could just be because of what you're doing to your brain. And then, yes, there's a lot of cultural, you know, as a Mormon, uh, and actually I just recorded a podcast with Zach, who's going to be one of the coaches that's working with me. We record a podcast and I have to make the video on YouTube live, but he um, was talking about how he was a virgin at 29. He's like physically, not mentally, because he's someone who's overcoming porn addiction. And the podcast is really great. It's a really great podcast that I just put up last week. But, you know, talking about how he fell into this because he wasn't, you know, supposed to be. Uh, and yes, and I just, I gave a big spiel to someone today about, you know, there is a biological need for sex, but there's not a biological need for porn or edging or even masturbation. That's hypersexuality and that, uh, that hijackers convincing you it's your biological need to keep leading you back for more. Um, Daniel has a question about how does a person heal from PMO following a divorce? Uh, very carefully. Um, but yeah, that's tough stuff is that honestly, it's the time for you to double down on not engaging in PMO because you're using it for mood regulation to offset the feelings that you have about your separation and divorce, which means you won't process them. And you need to be able to move through the grieving process, which is a five-step process. If you keep going back into the screen, you're avoiding that process. So you're making yourself feel better in the short run by avoiding the work of, you know, growing from your experience and coming to acceptance, which is the last phase of the grieving process. So I would really encourage you to follow this type of program. If you don't have the, you know, the inclination to join my program, start working some of the things that I'm telling you here today so you can get to the other side of it, process your divorce so that you don't pull this stuff into your next relationship, which you can have if you want.